Well, good morning. We've been in a conversation called The Garden, uh, where we have been immersing ourselves in the Garden of Eden, the Genesis story, the beginning of the most important book in human history. Uh, and we've just been immersing ourselves there for a bit, trying to uh, see what it is that God has for us, how he's trying to move us and, and grow us and stretch us and teach us and challenge us. And so uh, two weeks ago, we talked about creation and how wonderful it was that God created everything. And he didn't create from nothing, but he, he saw what was already there and spoke it into existence. And so uh, he created the world, and then he created us in his image. Just the great creator created us to create. And the byproduct of our life and our efforts and our work is that we are creative, and it should uh, be a reflection of Christ. And so last week we talked about the fall and sin and how it entered the world. And so uh, we understand that we're marked by sin, but Christ has come and did away with the effects of sin, and so we can walk in grace and mercy through Jesus. And this morning what I wanna do is I wanna talk about uh, work. I know you didn't come here on a weekend to talk about work, and I know that's not a word that we all want to really lean into. Uh, however, what I believe to be true, whether you like it or not, what I believe to be true is that since the beginning of time, we were created to work. That since mankind was created, uh, work was created for man. Man was created for work and work was created for man. And that exists and it continues in us. And even though we don't like the idea, this is what God has done. And so we need to seek to figure out what it is that God is doing in our lives and through our efforts. And in Genesis 2, uh, the scriptures talk, uh, beginning at verse 5, it says, Now no shrub had yet appeared on earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. If we pause here for a moment, we see that God is in the process of creating, and uh, if you know the story, you know which process he's in, and, and everything's uh, being formed and spoken into existence, and we have this like holy moment of pause, where God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. No rain, no trees, and the reason is there was no one to work. The stage is being set for the arrival of humanity, and yet God didn't need man to work. And I keep reflecting on this over and over. God didn't need to create a system where man needed to work. He could have created like self-trimming bushes and self-pruning uh, stuff and, and things that didn't need work. And yet he created this beautiful world which needed to be worked on, needed to be cultivated, needed to uh, be tended to, and therefore he needed man. And he created man. And he didn't just need man, but he wanted man. And he gave man purpose. And our purpose is found in the next passage. It says, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees growing out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the trees of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In this passage, we are able to glean quite a bit. First of all, we see that there, there was, uh, they didn't send rain because they didn't need things to grow because he needed someone to work. And so he created man and rains come and things start to grow and work begins to appear. Work begins to show up. Work begins to manifest itself. And then we see that the land was bare and God made trees and shrubs and fruit for man to eat to sustain his life. And he creates this beautiful world full of life and then he adds man at the center of it to work, to cultivate, and to create. I don't know about you, but I don't love doing outdoor work. I mean, I like it, but I also don't want it to be my hobby. I don't want it to be like uh, my part-time job. And yet, we have quite a bit of land, and work has to be done. Uh, this past weekend, my wife decided she didn't like the bushes in our little island. Uh, I liked them, she didn't, we compromised, I dug them out. Uh, we put a tree there, and uh, it was hard. It's hard work. I'm a little sore. Uh, my, my muscles and tendons, everything's just a little angry at me for it. And, and while I was working, I knew this message was coming, and, and I was being in real time reminded that man was created for work. And though we want to avoid it, and though we like to get away from it, and though we've tried to make it as easy as possible, we know because uh, uh, of Adam, work was hard, but uh, it didn't matter if Adam 
had sinned or not, God created man for work. He created us to get our hands in the dirt and, and to move and to work. And in verse 15, it says, the Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. That we find our purpose in work, that God created mankind for hard labor, for labor, it becomes hard after the fall, and we'll talk about that, but God created man for labor, and in Genesis we find God creating man, and he sets him to do work, he gives him a task, and it's not like a busy work, I don't like busy work, I don't like to do something with no intention or effort, God actually creates intentional work for us to involve ourselves in, not to occupy our mind, to keep our hands busy, but for us to glorify and honor him, and in this context we find one guy in the entire planet's and I don't know how that's even possible. I can't keep up with our grounds. Every time there's a, a gust of wind, there's sticks and leaves and trees down everywhere, and there's just constant work, and then you hit the fall, and everything falls again. you got to pick it all up, and it's constant. Uh, but yet, what I realize is that Adam didn't get overwhelmed. We don't read in Scripture where he gets a little anxious. I mean, I get up, and I'm like, man, this is a lot of yard. I'm a little stressed. And, and Adam, he's got the entire planet, and he's not worried and, and overwhelmed. And, and I've been commissioned to take care of the entire world, and so he just gets to work. I would imagine he just goes to it. And it doesn't really show that he was taught uh, or, or instructed. It was just instinctive. That Adam just instinctively knew what needed to be done, and he just did it. And I think that Many of us imagine that work is a part of the curse of sin, but it wasn't. God created work in the beginning, and God created man to instinctively and, and intently work on what was in front of him. And a lot of us have work that's been placed in front of us, and we often ignore it, or we push it aside, or we put it off. Anybody procrastinating on some projects, that garage that needs to be cleaned out, or whatever, and we, we push it down, we kick the can down just a little further. And yet what God did with Adam is he created him for work, and what he did with you and me is he created us for work. And you know there are things that need to be done, and you know there are things that we need to involve ourselves in, but the first thing we need to realize is that that work is holy, when we put our hands to the thing that God has called us to work on and do, it's holy work. And in Genesis 2.19, it says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and the wild animals. Now, we know all of this information. If you spent any time in, in church, we know uh, that, that Adam was there to, to work, and we know he named the animals, and he really phoned it in on some of those, I think. But the idea was that he was called to do it. And, and I, I look at this, and I go, so he has the entire planet to cultivate, to carve out, to create, to, to till up, whatever he's called to do. And then on top of that, God says, well, how about this? How about you name every single living creature on earth? And not only that, you can't avoid it. I'm going to have them come to you. I don't know if you ever get overwhelmed with tasks and projects and honeydew lists and uh, maybe even your own job that you, you get money for. You get overwhelmed sometimes. You feel like maybe there's too much. Life seems to stack more and more and more and more on you. And the more you push it off, the more it seems to stack and it gets harder and more overwhelming. And we get just completely consumed. And we don't see that with Adam. And yet Adam had to take care of the planet and he had to name every single animal. It seems as if God knew exactly what Adam was capable of doing. He didn't overwhelm him. He didn't stretch him too thin. He just kept giving him the work that he knew he could do. And a lot of us get overwhelmed because we don't understand our capacity. A lot of us get overwhelmed with good. We even feel like God has called us to do what's in front of us because we don't understand what God desires to accomplish through us. And many of us want to skate by and we want to do the minimum amount and we want to do the least. And yet God keeps calling us to more because he knows we're capable of more. And in a perfect world, in perfect conditions, God creates work. And it's interesting that we imagine utopia to be a vacation on a beach with a nice drink and no work. The hardest thing I have to do is read this book today and I don't even have to do it if I don't want to. That's the idea of utopia for so many of us, and yet when God designs the world in perfection, he designed it with work at the very epicenter of man's abilities. That God's perfect place for us is not void of work, but it's us in the midst of it. That God isn't asking us, though, to do something he's not willing to do himself. 
God invites us into work. And then what he does is he says, I'm actually going to work too. Not only am I going to invite you to work, but I'm going to be right in the middle of all the work and all the effort in Ephesians 2. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for him. Not only did God create us to do good work, but he actually created us as his handiwork. And we talked about this last week, his poem, uh, and God's writing this, the, the poem of our lives. And, and the idea is that we were created for good works, not only good works, but God actually prepared those good works for us ahead of time. So that hard thing in your life that's challenging and difficult, and you're constantly having to work on and work in, and you're ready to give up on, know that God prepared that for you ahead of time. I know that it doesn't seem like it. I know we want something different. Every task I get, I'm like, well, I'd like to take a different one instead of this one. But God's placed it in your life and in front of you for you to put your hands to, to work on and to work in because he believes you're capable of it. And a lot of times we protest, God, this is too much for me, this is overwhelming, it's too much, and God's going, you don't realize what you're capable of doing through me, that I've placed good works for you in your life. And it could be a job, it could be a relationship, it could be a person in your life. There are things around us that we are placed in front of so that we may go to work on. But God did the same for us, whereas handiwork, handcrafted and handmade, you are God's workmanship. No matter where you are in your relationship with God, your spiritual journey, know that you've been created by God to walk with God and for God to be at the epicenter of your life as well, that you are God's garden of Eden. He didn't put something on Adam that he didn't put on himself. God takes you and me and he places himself in the middle of our life to work and to tend to, to cultivate. And there are things in our life, there are weeds that are growing up that he's got to get to. There are attitudes and behaviors and mindsets and, and anxieties and, and fears and attitudes that he wants to eradicate and he goes to work on us. There are things he wants for us to, to grow, fruit that he wants to blossom and empathy and compassion and generosity and grace and, and mercy and you don't have it yet, I don't have it yet. And so he's got to till the ground up so that those things can flourish and grow. And the work that he's put us in seems overwhelming and challenging. And the work that he puts himself in is to help us be able to do the work that he's given us. Yet all of your mistakes and all of your scars and your wounds, your idiosyncrasies and your joys have been God right in the middle of them. And then some of us are more work for God than others. You just are. I just am. And some seasons are harder than others. But God still wants to work. And when you or at your worst, God becomes manifest at his best. And when things become challenging and difficult and hard, God rises up and when we sin and we make mistakes and we have attitudes and behaviors and mindsets and we get overwhelmed with the, the difficulties that God's placed in our life, God wants to be right there in the middle of it and he wants to prepare us and he wants to encourage us and strengthen us and challenge us to not give up because that's the easiest thing to do is to give up on the work that God's put in front of you whether that's people, whether that's a task, whether that's a dream or a job or whatever that is, the easy thing to do is to quit. It takes no effort. I quit, I walk off, I'm done. The hard thing though is to understand what God wants to do in you and through you. And then this passage that he's created you for good works. He knows ahead of time what he's created you for. Now when we think of good works, we think of going to the homeless shelter. When we think of good works, we think of uh, you know, feeding the homeless, we think of uh, doing a, you know, a oil change for a widow, we think of mowing our neighbor's lawn. When we think of good works in the context of an environment like this, we think of doing kind things for people who are less fortunate. That is wonderful, and God has called us to do those things, but not in this passage. This passage, when you chase this back, does not describe doing benevolent things for others. This passage actually describes the things that we do daily our job that we're paid to do, the time that we spend, whether Monday through Friday, Monday through Sunday, our lives, not just a segment. We want to compartmentalize. Well, this is God's time. This is work time. This is my personal time. And God says, I'm actually talking about all of it. Good works means everything that you have in front of you that we think that we work a job so that we can give and we can serve in our spare time. But God actually made you to work that job and we think that they're working that job is so we can do other things, but God's saying the other thing is the thing. The thing that you do is what I've called you to do. 
And what I've called you to do, I'm going to move through you and work through you. Meaning you don't have to go to a homeless shelter to find someone in need. You likely work with someone very near you in need. One of the challenges we're faced with in our current neighborhood is this is not a real impoverished neighborhood. We're not downtown with the homeless and, and, and people in destitute. And so we're challenged with how do we reach people who are complacent, who are content, who have just enough, but they still have needs. So how do we discover them? And when we discover them, how do we meet them? See, you and I have the capacity to be used by God in every facet of our lives. It's not just, I'm gonna segment this to help. God is saying, I want all of your life. It's not about what you do after five o'clock and you clock out. It's what you do your entire day. Are we reflecting God? Are we showing Jesus? Are we pointing people uh, to the love and grace that comes from God that we were created for work all the time? We were created to build and to dream and to create, to put our hands to the plow and to do whatever God calls us to do, but it's interesting to see how many people get by with average. Not you guys, but other people get by with average. They don't put 100% into it. We're just gonna give a little bit, and a lot of us are guilty of this at work, not me, but other people are guilty of this at work when they go to their job. Like, I'm just gonna do the minimum required to get by, and it's actually frustrating when you see people who have the potential to do more settle for less. And I can always imagine what it would be like if we all gave 100% at everything we did. What if we all gave our all at every task in front of us, every relationship, every uh, job, every task, every moment is something we gave 100% to because what we need to be reminded of is that whatever we do, we reflect Christ in it. It has the capacity to reflect Christ in your job, in your home, in your relationships, in your family, in your neighborhood. It all reflects Jesus. And in Colossians 3.23, it says, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. See, a lot of us, uh, well, all of us, if you have a, a, a boss, they're a human, right? We don't work for the robots yet, but it's coming probably. The idea, though, is that we work for humans, Right, naturally, humans sign our paychecks and they uh, work in HR and they, they're there, like humans are all around us. And we have this natural tendency to feel like we work for other people. But what Colossians is reminding us of is that even though it may look like you're working for other people, you're actually working for the Lord. And even though other people sign your checks and deposit in your, your bank account, it's actually God who is investing in us. And it says, if we'll work unto the Lord, it says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it's the Lord you're serving. Everything you do, done to the Lord, because it's the Lord that we're serving. And it gives us a promise. Uh, it says, you're going to receive an inheritance, a reward from the Lord. Now, I don't know exactly what it's talking about. I don't know if it's talking about eternity or Joel Osteen's money. What I do know, though, is whatever the reward is from the Lord, I want it. Whatever the inheritance is that comes from God, I don't want to miss out on it. So the challenge then is that everything that we do, every conversation we have, every uh, job that we do, no matter how menial the task it seems to be, we do it as if we're doing it under the Lord. Somebody pays you, which means you have a contract to do a job, but that contract is not with the human employer. The scriptures say that contract is with God. And he signs you up, and there's a sign-on bonus, and we've got to make sure that we're doing everything we can to honor and glorify him. An average might get you by with a human boss, but it's not going to get us by with God because he knows your capacity. He knows your potential. He knows when we're giving it 30% and when we're giving it 100%. He knows what we're capable of. And just like he looks at Adam and says, yeah, you're going to take care of the earth, and you're going to name all these animals, he's looking at us going, I know you feel a little overwhelmed, but just focus on me. Because when you focus on me and you walk in me, you're gonna realize you're stronger than you thought you were through Christ. And I know those tasks, those hard things seem overwhelming, but God is bigger and he's stronger and he's greater. But the natural response when we go to work is that there's gonna be uh, some resistance. There's just gonna be a little bit of resistance in everything we do. I'm digging bushes up and there's a lot of resistance. Every little root was a reminder that there's resistance in the work that we do, that with every task there's always gonna be obstacles and complications and problems to overcome. And that's where we get to be creative and that's where God gets to come in and intervene. But I need you to know that those resistances are God's opportunity to prove his strength and his might in our lives. And in Genesis 2.20 it says, the man gave names to all the livestock 
to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. Man is working. He's doing what God called him to. But no helper was found as his complement. We find the problem. Man's working. He's got a relationship with God. But he needs a helpmate. He needs someone to compliment him. Even in a perfect world, in perfect conditions, there's an obstacle. And some of us, we still have this obstacle in your life. But the reality is there's always going to be some resistance. There's always going to be some obstacle. There's always going to be some challenge. And what we often do is we use those obstacles as excuses to quit. Well, they didn't do what I said. I'm going to give up. They didn't act like that. I'm going to give up. This was harder than I thought it would, so I quit. And we use those obstacles. I don't have a helpmate. i got to do it alone. So I quit. And what God wants to do is he wants to provide what we need in the moment. It says, so the Lord God caused the deep sleep to come over the man. And he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at the place. And then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And all of the men say amen. The idea is that Adam needed help. He needed a helpmate. He needed assistance. And God knew man would need help. And so he created woman. God seldom calls us to things we can accomplish as we are. God seldom calls us to accomplish things we can do in our own strength. God seldom, if ever, calls us to do things where we don't need assistance. And Adam had the entire plan to cultivate. And when it comes time, uh, God gives him exactly what he needed in the exact moment he needed it. But I don't know if you're like me, but you start something. You think it's going to be easier than it is. You jump in. Uh, It's a hubris that, that most of us have. And we dive in. And then it becomes a little harder than we thought. It becomes a little more overwhelming. And everything's really exciting to start but it's not real exciting to complete, right? There's that middle of everything we do where it's like, ah, do I really want to finish this? Do I really want to complete this project? Do I really want to stick this out? Do I really want to stay through this pain or this process or this heartache? And you realize the project, when you started it, didn't seem overwhelming, but the first day you start, it seems overwhelming. And maybe you have this moment with God and you're like, God, we're gonna take the world. I have this vision and I have this goal. I have this ministry. I have this thing. And, and you're like, yeah, God, let's go. And then the next day rolls around and you're like, God, where are you? I feel alone. I'm stuck, I'm stuck doing this by myself. And, and, and the next morning you can't, you can't seem to figure out what you're gonna do first. And you quit. And inside of all of us is this drive and this determination to hustle and to do work. But when the work really happens, we tend to wanna bow out. Either we create resistance or resistance is created in us, but regardless, we stop. We give up. And every single one of us deal with the temptation of quitting. All of us do. We have to ask ourselves, though, in these moments where resistance seems to be uh, overwhelming or impenetrable, we have to ask ourselves the question, is this battle mine to fight? Is this resistance mine to push past? The first question we ask ourselves is, is this even my resistance, right? Sometimes we come into resistance and it's because it's not for us to push through. There are warriors and thugs. Thugs fight for no reason. They fight every fight they can come across, but warriors are intentional. God's called us to be intentional about the battles we fight and the the persistence that we try to push through. And sometimes we're trying to push through a wall that's not ours to be pushing through. And, and, And the question isn't, can I win this? Can I push through it? Can I power through it? The question is, is this even my battle to fight? Has God even put this in front of me for me to even be working on or working in? Sometimes we get distracted. Maybe we do things because it's the way we want to do them or it's what we want to accomplish. And it becomes really challenging and difficult and God's going, it's really hard for you because I haven't called you to that. I've called you to this. It's going to be hard too, but this is what I've called you to. That we pick our battles, we're intentional about our fights, and and when you fight a a battle that is yours to fight, you actually feel strong and healthy with every step you take. There are two types of battles. There's hard and healthy, and hard and unhealthy. And the reality is when we're facing resistance, we have to ask ourselves, is this hard and healthy? Am I energized by this? When I wake up every day, am uh, am I feeling excited about the task at hand, or am I feeling drained and depleted and overwhelmed and anxious and fearful? Is this my battle to be fighting? Is this something I should be doing? Is it hard and healthy? Because a lot of things are difficult. But not everything's healthy. 
Uh, when we started working on Deanna's house, we walked in, it was overwhelming looking, and the first question I asked uh, Darlene, who spearheaded the event, was, is this hard and healthy for you? Are you feeling energized by this, or is this overwhelming? Because if it's unhealthy, we don't need to be a part of it. If it is healthy, though, we know that that's exactly where God has called us to be. A lot of us use the metric of, well, this is hard, this must not be God. But God is in the hard things. It's actually how he proves his strength through us. Just because something is difficult doesn't mean God's not in it. Is it healthy? If it's unhealthy, it's likely that God's not in it and he hasn't called us to it. But here's the thing. You are that hard and healthy thing for God. You don't realize it. You would never admit it or articulate it. But God has placed himself, if you've allowed him to, at the center of your life. And he's working on you and in you. And it's difficult for him. Some of us are more difficult than others. You can elbow your spouse. The idea, though, is that God's at the center and he's working and moving. You're hard and healthy for God. He loves to work on you. He loves to put the pieces of your life back together. He loves it when you come to him broken or angry or or, or disappointed or or fearful because he gets to come and be alongside you. And many times, most of us aren't open to the reality that God is near us until we're at our wit's end, until we're broken, until we're fearful or anxious. A lot of us move with automation, not even contemplating God until something happens and we're like, oh, and God's right there. He says, I'm here the whole time. You're just more aware of me. You're that hard and healthy thing for God. You're that healthy resistance. So often we're the ones that fight what God is trying to do in our lives. God's trying to create love or empathy or compassion or generosity and we're just fighting him at every front but he doesn't give up on us. He's patient, he's waiting, but he's not gonna give up on us. You may have given up on God, but he does not give up on us. You have to ask yourself, is the thing that I'm doing difficult, but is it making me a better person for the people around me? Is it making me more like Christ in the process? As I'm walking and moving and pushing through resistance, is it actually making me more like Christ? Is it refining me? Or is this resistance taking from the quality of my life? Is it making me less like Christ in the process? And this is important if you're a parent. This is important if you're an employee or an employer. This is important if you're retired or a manager or a spouse. This is important for us as followers of Christ to understand when things are uh, taking from us and when they're giving to us. There are things in our lives that God won't make go away for a reason. And I get mad and I get frustrated. It's a resistance, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't love us and he's not meeting us. He's trying to do something in us through the process. It means that he is working something out in us that can only take part through the resistance. We can only learn and grow through this process. And God may allow resistance for us, but it always has a purpose. He may allow life's circumstances to, uh, to be a resistance for us and be hard for us But there's something good on the other side if we won't quit and the next time you feel resistance in a task, the next time something feels challenging, ask yourself, is this making me better? Is God teaching me something through this? Because you're gonna wanna quit. But I want you to remind yourself that God has created you for what you're doing and resistance is a natural part of the growth process. People who go to the gym know this. People who try to run long distances know this. People who try to learn an instrument know this. Resistance is just part of the growth process. And we want to avoid it. We want to skip out on it. And yet, God has often called us to it. Every step Adam took was work at every front, everywhere he looked. You work a job, you clock out, you go home, you don't see work. Adam saw work everywhere, and yet he was energized by it. This is what God had called him to. So the next time you face resistance, ask yourself, is this hard and healthy? See, the opposite example would be a guy named Jonah. Jonah was feeling resistance in his life in that he was in the belly of a whale, And that's resistance. That's big resistance. Yet, he was there because he was trying to run from what God wanted to do and not run towards what God wanted to do. That a lot of us are experiencing resistance in our lives because we're trying to run from God. And God loves us too much to let us get too far and he's allowing the natural consequences of life to push us back to him where he's waiting to heal us and help us and repair us. But we're feeling resistance because we're fighting God. And sometimes we can actually do really good things for God, but become less like him in the process. And there's the resistance there where God is saying, no, I'm inviting you to turn from where you're going and come back to me. The second is the opposite. It's hard and unhealthy. 
There are hard and unhealthy things in our life. And for many of us, we think what we're doing is hard and meaningful when in reality it's, it's, it's a Jonah situation. We're running from God. That's not our fight to fight. That's, not our, that's God's job or that's someone else's job. And, and we're trying to push through a wall that was never meant for us to be pushing through. And we're fighting, feeling resistance, thinking that this is what's supposed to happen when in reality it's God saying, no, no, that's not for you. That's not, that's for someone else. We might be thinking that, that this is hard and healthy, but others around you are going, no, you seem unhealthy. You've lost weight, you're not getting sleep, you don't look good, like that's not healthy for you anymore. But the problem is it's often difficult to tell when resistance is hard and healthy and hard and unhealthy. We're not the most self-aware people, so we need people around us. God created helpmates for a reason. There are people around us in our lives that are to assist us, to remind us that there are things in our life that are ours to fight and things we're supposed to give him. There are people in our lives, our spouses and, and our community, the people around us who are assisting us and moving us and helping us and, 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 and then letting us know when we've gone too far and when we need to come back to him. And the reality is we've got to surround ourselves with those people who can look us in the eye and go, that's not your fight to fight. That's God's fight or that's someone else's fight. Then in order to, for us to find out if this battle is yours, we immerse ourselves ultimately in God's word. Surround ourselves with scripture. We get in God's word to see what he's called us to, that the fight you're in now may not be yours to fight, but God will reveal that to you if you'll allow him to. Depending on your desire to work and your ability to persevere, we're gonna either succeed or fail. The last thing that we find is that there's either success or failure. And for Adam, we find in Genesis 3, 17, it says, and he said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it for you are dust and you will return to dust. It's in this moment, and we'll talk more about this next week, that God curses the ground. Work wasn't the punishment. Hard work was. Work wasn't the punishment. It was in the design of creation. But the ground being challenging and us sweating and, and toiling and, and having challenges is part of the punishment. But here's what's beautiful, and we'll talk again more about this next week. Even in the punishment, God is providing. He's giving them nourishment. He's giving them food. God is even in the hard stuff for us because he doesn't leave us. And often we say we wouldn't have to work if it weren't for Adam, but we would. It just would be a little easier. And yet God is right there in the midst of it. But what I see in Adam's life is he's doing what God's called him. He's tilling the ground. He's carving out things. He's building. He's dreaming. Uh, he's working. He's naming animals left and right. He's just going crazy with it. And everybody's getting names and everything's getting done. And he's doing all of these things that God has called him to do. And yet he's neglecting something which ends up causing him to give in to temptation. We find that Adam is busy doing what God has called him to do. But when Eve presents the apple, we find that a problem presents itself. That he gives in to temptation. Many times in our lives, we can be doing the right thing all at the right time, but if we're not cultivating our soul, if we're not being clear about uh, our heart's condition, if we're immersing ourselves in things that are uh, unhealthy for us long enough, we wear ourselves down and we give in to sin. We give in to temptation. And we can succeed in a lot of things and yet fail it with God. It's, most, most concerned about our soul. We can gain the whole world, but lose the soul. And Adam may have been successful at naming animals and taking care of things, but he wasn't successful at resisting temptation. It was hard for him, and yet that's where God invites, uh, invites us to open ourselves up. In Philippians it says, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Christ. He's gonna keep working. Even in Adam's life, we see that he kept working. He kept moving, and we'll see this next week, but God's not done with you. This morning, I want you to know God's not done with you. He's placed something in front of you and it's challenging. But he wants to teach you something. He wants to show you something. He wants to stretch your faith. He wants to increase something in your life. And I don't know what it is. And I wish, I wish I could see and I'd be like, hey, that's why you have this in your life. And that's why you have that in your life. And, and this is what you're supposed to learn. And this is what you're supposed to do. That'd be so easy. But that's not the way it works. We've got to go to God and say, God, what are you, in, what are you bringing into my life? And what are you trying to teach me in the process of it? This has happened. Why? This is the resistance I'm facing. Is it hard and healthy or unhealthy? And if it's healthy, then 
Give me the strength, the power through that God doesn't call us to anything we don't need him to help us accomplish. And so we lean on him. If you would bow your head and close your eyes this morning.